being in kindergarten and praying every night that God would turn me into a boy. Any time a sign of being a girl came up, I would, I would push it down and push it away and created quite a, a boy self. I was surprised, you know, I, I didn't expect to be a lesbian. I didn't sort of say, okay, now we're gonna go be a lesbian. It was more like the feeling crept up on me and I, and I just couldn't get this woman out of my mind. Bless them. God bless those women for sticking it out with me. They saw past all of my posturing, past all of my brokenness, a woman who needed Jesus. And they stuck with me in that. Welcome to Pure Passion. My name is Colette Burkew. One of the most damaging things that can happen to a child while growing up is for them to have an absence of affirmation from their parents, especially the same-sex parent. When a boy is not affirmed by his father or a girl by her mother, the child sets out on a subconscious search for love, affection, and approval. They need to find someone who will tell them who they are and that they are good and worthwhile. Today's guest was just such a young lady. Growing up in a dysfunctional family where neither father nor mother gave her a healthy sense of affirmation, Christy fell victim to a child molester and in the resulting confusion, began to seek out affection in the arms of other females. In fact, she became so dependent on them that she began to feed off their personalities in order to construct her own identity. Christy is an amazing woman of God today. She has the capacity to describe the lesbian neurosis in great detail and with insight and honesty. Let's take a journey with her into the mind and heart of the lesbian and discover how Jesus can set them free. My mom tells me that she really wanted a girl when she was pregnant, and uh, when I was born, her first words to me were, it's gonna be different for you. And what she was really meaning by that was, uh, she knew that I was born into a family system that was broken, that wasn't really working, and she knew that the women got the raw end of the deal. She knew that the men treated the women badly, but the women also treated the women badly. There's all these stories of, you know, women beating their daughters and being mean to their daughters, and, and everybody just sort of said, you know, it's a man's world, and we women sort of exist to serve the men. And my mom saw that, and she wanted something else for me, but she herself couldn't walk out in that, and so, uh, I took that in at a very, very young age, so young, in fact, that my mom says my first full sentence was, I wish I was a boy. And she, she later confirmed that and said, you know, it's good that you wish you were a boy. It means that you want to be free and independent and a, and a whole person and, and have a mark in the world. And so there was a system in place that basically took uh, femininity and the female uh, sense of femininity and just said, this is really not good. The boys have it better. And, and I figured that out very, very early. And so my whole childhood, I remember, like, I remember being in kindergarten and praying every night that God would turn me into a boy. And I remember jumping up the next morning and running to the bathroom to see if he had. And uh, I, I even remember I, my mom was trying to get me to dress like a girl, and so she would put me in skirts. I hated skirts. And when I was in first grade, I took a big old safety pin and I pinned the skirt front and back together because I wanted it to be shorts and promptly fell down the stairs because you can't walk like that. I think that was the end of me wearing skirts. Um, but so there was this system in place that said, you know, it's better to be a boy. And on, laced on top of that, or layered on top of that system, unfortunately, my dad had his own issues. Uh, he was dealing with sexual addiction issues and brought some things into the house that I shouldn't have seen. Uh, but more importantly, it was the way he looked at women, both my mom and others, as, as sexual objects. And I could see that, that he didn't look at them like people to connect with in, in a healthy way. And, and I took that in, and, I, and I, th I think I understood that to be sort of women are really for pleasure, men's pleasure. And, and 
to raise the children and to basically serve their husbands. My grandparents, my grandfathers both treated their wives that way, and that was just the way the system worked. So I wanted none of that. And, and I really did suppress any sign of being a girl. And any time a sign of being a girl came up, I would, I would push it down and push it away and created quite a, a boy self. I ran around with my brother. And uh, in fact, I had such a strong boy self that when I was 10 years old, I got kicked out of a girl's bathroom because I looked so much like a boy that they didn't think I was a girl. And, and that carried all the way up through, through my childhood. And, and so we, we start then with this sense of real gender imbalance. I did not see myself as a girl. I saw myself as a boy. I wanted to be a boy. Everything about me wanted to be a boy. Later on top of that, I did not see boys as safe. I did not see men as someone I would want to connect with in any way. My parents' marriage was not in very good shape, and so my any... any um, any patterning of healthy male-female relationship was absent. And there was constant fighting. There was, there was just a complete lack of harmony in the home. So there was no modeling for that. On top, of, on top of that, when I turned about 10, my parents' marriage really started to dissolve. And three things happened that I think sort of nailed the coffin for me at that point. One was that uh, my father sat my brother and I down, and he played an old song. Uh, from the 70s, in which uh, it's a very graphic rock song in which a boy and a girl are getting hot and heavy in the back seat of the car, and the girl stops the boy and says, I'm not going to have sex with you unless you tell me that you're going to marry me. And the boy, in the heat of passion, says, I'll marry you because you want me to. And then the last kind of phrase of the song is, and now I'm miserable and I wish I could get rid of you. And my father sits my brother and I down, and he plays this song for us. He says, this is a story of my relationship with your mom. And this is what... This is where our relationship went. And so I had absolutely no vision for healthy heterosexual relating at all. At the same time, I was sexually abused by a family member. And then on top of that, my, my mom, sort of finally fed up with the situation, decided to join a traveling acting group. And she would leave the home for kind of weeks at a time and leave me alone with my brother and my father my brother and my father, in their broken states, would go out and party all night long together. And so I was home alone, uh, watching TV uh, all night. And this is in the days when the TV would go off the air. And I remember watching the TV go off the air and waking up at, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning on the couch and going out to the local McDonald's and getting fast food breakfasts. And I remember hoping, you know, that somebody would notice, like, maybe there's something going on with this kid. Why is she here alone? But nobody ever did. The first part of my childhood, we did go to church. And I, I, so I had some sort of a faith in God. In fact, I remember being small and wanting to run away from home. And the only thing I took was my Bible. I thought, well, that's interesting. I have a memory of that, but I don't really have a memory of a relationship with God. I think by the time I was six or seven, we moved to a new state, and we stopped going to church after we moved. And, and God sort of faded off the scene. There was no sense of maybe I can run to him for help. My attitude by the time I was probably 13 was, if God exists, he'll come and find me. But I don't really have a need for him. Part of what happened in that that time when my my parent when my parents were splitting up was I spent so much time alone, and I got extremely lonely, and that was a very painful time of my life. And never in that time did I think, "Oh God, help!" There was no sense of God's presence uh, at that point in my life. I had learned not to look there. What I did do was become very independent and very tough, so that by the time I hit ninth grade, I was. I had the mouth of a sailor. I was just sort of very edgy and tough. If you or a loved one suffers from lesbian confusion, there is hope. Former lesbian Ann Polk has written an outstanding book on the subject entitled Restoring Sexual Identity, Hope for Women Who Struggle with Same-Sex Attraction. In the book, Anne answers the difficult questions posed by homosexuals and their loved ones about the journey out of homosexual neurosis. Yes, change is possible through Jesus Christ. To get a copy for you or for a friend, just go to purepassion.us. 
If you are a sexually broken person, someone who loves one, or a leader in search of helpful resources, our primary ministry website is purepassion.us, where you can find over 180 videos, all arranged by topic for easy access. We also have audio files of entire conferences featuring some of the finest teachers in the field of sexual brokenness. Visit our online store for the latest in books, DVDs, and CDs on the topic of sexual brokenness. Hundreds of videos, audio files, articles, and more. Just go to purepassion.us. When I was sexually abused, it was at a time, it was in that period of time when I was spending a lot of time alone. And I remember thinking, at least I'm getting some attention. And even if it's, if it's weird attention, it's attention. And I remember feeling like it, it, in some ways it met a, a strange need. Much, much later, I had a situation, well, after I became a Christian, I had a situation in which I was in a first floor apartment and I was flashed. And uh, it scared the daylights out of me. And, and I went to some friends of mine and we prayed over, uh, over that event because it really scared me, undid me. And one of the things that came up in that prayer time was this sense of deserving it. Like, well, you know, you are an object of perversion after all. You were an object of perversion back when you were 10, and now you're an object of perversion here. And that is what you are after all. And that was a, a belief that I came to believe about myself that was planted way back when I was 10 and not really discovered until I was 24. And, and God, in, at that moment, really redeemed, um, redeemed that whole situation because he said, you, I do not see you as an object of, of perversion. You are, and, and he gave me visions of being a holy, elegant daughter, princess of the Most High God. And it was a very regal, healing moment that I didn't even know I needed. So I had so internalized this this abuse as, as sort of what happens to girls and what happens to me as a girl, because I was off, obviously, that it, it just stuck in my identity until, until much later when God was able to expose it and reveal that. So when I was 13 years old, my parents uh, sent me to boarding school as a way to facilitate their divorce. My mother didn't want my father to have me. My father didn't want my mother to have me, so they sent me to boarding school. And uh, in a way, it was good. It got me out of the house. But it, it really did seal up uh, any sense of, of family was gone. You know, my family dissolved. They were divorced about two weeks after I got to boarding school. And uh, at, so at the time, you know, I had all of these layers, right? I had the gender issues. I had the mom leaving and abandonment issues. I had the sexual abuse issues. All of that was, was there. And I didn't know any of that. What I did know is that starting my freshman year in high school, I started to fall in love with my friends, my female friends. I was very attached. I got very attached to uh, my best friend in high, in, my, in high school my freshman year. And that was not reciprocated, and that, so that was just painful. But the second year, I, was attached, I got attached to a girl who was a senior, and it was reciprocated, and that was the first physical um, relationship that I had that that really was sort of intimate and felt like love, and I felt so full, and, and so there was sort of a sense of relief in that relationship. Well, then she graduated, and, and that was tremendously painful, sort of reopened the whole abandonment wound for me. When I uh, first fell in love with my first um, friend, as it was, I felt like I just wanted to be with her all the time. I felt like being with her, I felt like I was worth something. I was valued uh, if I was with her. And then when it was reciprocated in, the, in my second year, I just, it felt like I was no longer alone. And that was a huge relief to my, my heart. I just didn't want to be alone. And, and her affection and her care for me, um, it, it took away that lonely feeling. Uh, it made me feel like I had value. And, and it really felt tremendously uh, comforting to me. I was surprised, you know. I, I didn't expect to be a lesbian. I didn't sort of say, okay, now we're going to go be a lesbian. It was more like the feeling crept up on me, and I, and I just couldn't get this woman out of my mind. I thought about her all the time. I wanted to be with her all the time. I wrote her notes all the time. It didn't occur to me that I was walking into lesbianism. I was, I was too young, and, and back then it wasn't quite so talked about. So... Uh, it didn't really, I didn't say, oh, this must be my lesbian, that must be what I am. It was more like, wow, I just love this girl, you know, she's so wonderful. 
I remember distinctly uh, my, my junior year in high school, I became involved with a girl, uh, and that was perhaps my pivotal lesbian relationship. It lasted longer. It was much more intense. It was, it was very, very um, absorbing. And I, and I had this, this memory of putting my hand on her shoulder and thinking to myself, as I looked at my hand on her shoulder, I can see my soul leaving my body and going into her. And it feels so beautiful. And this must be true love. This must be what it is to love someone. To, to not know where I end and she begins. We are becoming one. This must be just what it's really all about. It's odd because there, there was a double thing going on here. I, I didn't feel any shame about my feelings, for the, for especially not this woman, my, the last lover I had, because it was so intoxicating and so wonderful and such a relief to me, and I was so happy in this relationship that shame was not a part of it, but it was a secret. And, and obviously my external persona, I had really suppressed femininity. People could see that I had suppressed femininity. All of my childhood, I wasn't able to identify with my same-sex peers because I didn't want to be one of them. And so there was an isolation from my peers and that continued on through high school. And so in, as, in elementary school, as well as in high school, periodically people would make comments like, Christy's gay, or Christy's a lesbian, or and I remember distinctly somebody calling me a dyke, and that was such a painful thing. So I don't, I don't quite know why that was so painful, since it was essentially I was, it was more or less embracing this relationship. But to be called a dyke, to be called a lesbian, really cut me to the core. It felt, it felt horrible, and and I walked in the shame of that. So there was ex the, the extent to which my community rejected me because of my feelings, that really brought shame. But the feelings themselves, I wasn't like ashamed to be in love with this woman. One of the challenges of not identifying with my mom way back when I was a child was that I couldn't really bond with her. I didn't really connect with her in a way that fed who I was. And, and moms do, you know, same-sex parents help establish a sense of being, help establish a sense of who you are. And if I can't connect with my mother, then I lose that from the very beginning. And that was certainly the case with me. I couldn't get a sense of who I was from her. And then later, as you hit puberty, it's the, it's the father's job to call you out as a woman and to say, this is what it is to be opposite, other from me, and, and to be a flower and a beautiful flower and, and treasured by men. Of course, I didn't get any of that. And so, it's combined, I had no real sense of who I really was. I had constructed this self that sort of was functioning, but none of it was, was called forth from who I truly was. So bring that into, into relationship, I was on the hunt for me. I was on the hunt for completion. I was, I, was, I was sort of a shadow of a person that I had made, but I didn't really know who that was. So this lover that I had in, in high school, she personified much of what I thought was excellent in a person. She was strong, she was thoughtful, she was gentle, and, and she was sort of, she had this quiet wisdom about her that I, I really was drawn to. And I was really wanting those attributes for myself. I was really looking for myself and her. Much later, I discovered that I have many of those attributes, that that is part of who God created. And so I see, I saw it in her, and I wanted it, and I, and I was attracted to it. Uh, so, so that was fundamental in that relationship. You know, the fact that first she wanted me, that made me feel terrific. This woman that I thought was amazing had all these traits that I wish I had had, that I actually did have, but wasn't in touch with, wanted me. And so that was a tremendously intoxicating and comforting experience for me. Announcing the ever-widening world of access to Pure Passion, now available on smart devices and set-top boxes. If you own an Android device, iPhone, iPad, or iPod Touch, watch us anytime and anywhere via our free Pure Passion app. And if you own a Roku box for your TV, we now have a free Pure Passion channel, which has become one of the most popular Christian channels on Roku. You'll find us listed among the religion channels, from God's mouth to your ear. Help whenever you need it. 
If you or a loved one suffers from lesbian confusion, there is hope. Former lesbian Ann Polk has written an outstanding book on the subject entitled Restoring Sexual Identity, Hope for Women Who Struggle with Same-Sex Attraction. In the book, Anne answers the difficult questions posed by homosexuals and their loved ones about the journey out of homosexual neurosis. Yes, change is possible through Jesus Christ. To get a copy for you or for a friend, just go to purepassion.us. We graduated from high school, uh, and and the relationship started to fall apart as we graduated. She could she she could see that it was a little intense and obsessive, and I think in some ways it really drove her a little bit nuts. And so she pulled away, which of course she had my soul in her body, so that was terrifying to me, completely devastating. I went off to college, and uh, I went off to the West Coast. I we were I went to school on the East Coast, went to university on the West Coast, and. And I remember when I arrived at, in, in, at college, I was very tough, had a very strong edge to me. I was a rower. I had started rowing in high school. And so I walked kind of with this tough jock swagger. I had a little sneer on my face. And uh, just, you know, kind of you don't touch this sort of approach to life. Loud, brash, boisterous sense of humor. Uh, and, and the very wonderful thing about Jesus <laughs> is that he knew, he knew what I needed and when I needed it. So here I was at college. I had now identified myself as a lesbian. I'm like, okay, this, is, this, is, this works for me. This lesbian relationship worked for me. I want another one. And I walked around, you know, I would walk by the gay and lesbian clubhouse on campus and I would think, hmm, I wonder if I'll go in there today. Maybe today's the day. I was actually considering getting a gender change uh, because I kept falling in love with these women that were really cool. I thought, well, if I could only marry them, then that would be... That would fix the problem. But it just so happens that I went to probably the only school in the country that had a Christian crew coach. And this was pivotal for me because rowing was my life. I was very, very good at it. It was an area where I was confident. And if there was anybody I wanted to impress on the planet, it would be my crew coach. So I found out that my crew coach was Christian. And this was at a time when actually most of the crew coaches in the country were lesbians, but mine wasn't. Mine was Christian. And I, uh, I heard she was a Christian, and I went to her and I said, so, you know any good churches I can go to? And it was purely for her, you know, to impress her. And, and she said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. And she hooked me up with some of the Christian rowers. Little did I know that this was the beginning of a massive conversion for me. I saw these women relate to each other in a way that was just so attractive and, and irresistible to me. I saw these Christian women loving each other from the heart with true calling each other out, really supporting each other. There was no posturing. There was no pretend you're really cool, pretend I need you, make me you need me. There was none of that going on. There was just pure, straight love. And I thought, that is cool. I, I kind of want that. And, and that started us on these, on these conversations. I would talk to them about God, but I was, very, I was very tough. And I would tell them how stupid they were for believing that Jesus died. I mean, come on, Jesus died and rose from the dead. What, are you crazy? I just didn't have, I had no respect. And, uh, but I, they, God bless them. God bless those women for sticking it out with me. They saw past all of my posturing, past all of my brokenness, a woman who needed Jesus. And they stuck with me in that. And to this day, I am astounded at their commitment to me because I was rude. I was not likable. I was not someone that you would want to minister to. And yet they stood by me and they pressed in. And I think Jesus lived in these women. And uh, at the same time, I started struggling intellectually with the faith. I read apologetics. I was, I was very... It was important to me not to just jump into something for some emotional reason. And so I was at a school where actually Christianity was torn down quite a bit. And uh, it was known to be a school where kids went in as Christians and came out as atheists because they would systematically tear apart the gospel and the Bible as, as literature is not true. And, and they would tear religion, Christian religion especially, apart. But I found myself not, not too... Far, far into the school year, engaging my professor, saying, well, now I hear that you can't prove the Bible's true, but it seems to me that you can't prove that it's not true either. Isn't that right? And I would, I would really engage with them, and they'd be like, yeah, but you know, and we'd get in these fights, and I'm like, why am I 
fighting about this, you know, because aren't I on their team? <laughs> and slowly I began to realize that I was in a, a place where I was intellectually ready to say, yes, I believe crazy things like Jesus could walk through walls and walk on water. And, and I was willing to sort of say, I think this might actually be true. It all came to a head when I went home for the holidays and I, and I hooked back up with this woman that I had been involved with in high school. And it was tremendously clear that she had moved on. And I was devastated. I'm like, wow, she's gone. And, and I remember it was very melodramatic. I was out on the streets in the rain crying and I ended up on the front, at the steps of this church going, God, this is terrible, I'm gonna die. This is awful. I don't, I don't know what to do. It was on the plane on the way home, on the way back to school, that I finished reading Josh McDowell's book, More Than a Carpenter. And at the very end, he has a prayer of conversion, essentially. And I said, okay, it's time. And I went ahead and prayed it. And I became a Christian on the airplane on the way back to school. And I'm so glad I did. <laughs> when I look back on that relationship, um, I mean, the simple Christian word to use would be idolatry. She was my God. She was my everything. And I, I really looked to her. I put so much on her. I think there was a mother bond going on there. There was a compulsive clinging to her that I later, much later, came to understand as being kind of infantile and, and, and needing her to sort of mother me and cover me and protect me. Uh, so there was, there was that involved. There was sort of a, a, an ease my loneliness aspect to it. I think later I came to understand just how lonely I really was. And, and there was this, just kind of cover that, fill that in for me. Certainly there were spiritual strongholds uh, built in that relationship. It took, it took a while to fully detach my heart from that relationship. Unfortunately, I've had some experience with emotional dependency since. And, and I've seen this cycle of attaching myself to someone, getting my sense of worth and being from another person. And once you do that, you're connected to that person until you pray that connection off. And, and I had to really pray that connection off and, and say, I, I break that in the name of Jesus and pull away because there was a spiritual connection that happens. I mean, for me to choose to pour my soul into another person is a terrible choice, but it's one that has consequences and I have to get my soul back. And I think the only, only one who can, is capable of doing that is Jesus through his power of taking, taking me back and putting me back in myself where I belong.